My name is Lane Brown, and I've been working to push Photoshop's brush system to its limits. My goal was simple, create the best, most useful, and well-organized brush pack for Photoshop that would serve my personal needs as an artist and illustrator. These are tools that, after countless iterations and fine-tuning, I've grown to love, and now I'm excited to share them with you. I must admit, this brush pack is huge. You'll find hundreds of brushes encompassing a full range of traditional and digital effects. Therefore, I've decided to break this pack up into its three major components. You'll find brushes for all things painting, including dozens of versatile brushes that I use for concept art and illustration. The next set is full of drawing tools, which includes brushes for all sorts of dry media such as pencils, charcoal, and pastels. And the final set is for inking, which is designed for those who love the look and feel of traditional ink, but might prefer the flexibility and editing power that digital provides. I want to emphasize that this is not your typical brush pack. This is designed as a complete tool set for Photoshop. I think you'll have fun exploring this brush pack, and I'm certainly enjoying them with my own work, so I look forward to seeing what you create with them. All right. Welcome back to Proco, everybody. <laughs> uh, today we're joined by an artist who makes art look easy and wants to make art easier for you. I stuck the landing. <laughs> Lane, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing great. It's a beautiful uh, day it... in South Carolina. Oh, is that where you are? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Okay. Where, where is everybody else in the chat right now? I, I saw someone's here from India. Um, and I, I don't know, usually there's always like that, like massive influx of everyone saying where they are, but only the one person. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so like, what are we doing today? All right, so today I'm happy to present to everyone my new and huge brush pack for Photoshop. Um, I'll just go ahead and drag it up on screen. Okay, uh, let me see here. There we go, right. there's your brush pack. Yeah, so this has been years in the making. Um, honestly, it took much longer than I expected because originally I thought it would be fairly small, pretty simple, but I just <laughs> got carried away, got a bit obsessed, and now it's massive, and I am so happy to finally share it with everyone. I am a uh, professional illustrator and concept artist, so um, I'm making brushes for myself, first and foremost, that I actually use for my work. Um, but now I'm happy to share with everyone. And so uh, the first part of this presentation, I'll just kind of run through the brush pack, but I definitely want to get into the demo for you guys. I'll do some drawing, some painting, and some inking. Okay. All right. Um, I guess uh, here, I'm, I'm going to make this screen a little bit bigger so people don't have to deal with our faces as you show some stuff. All right. So there's that. And okay. Take it away. So, yeah. So on screen, uh, the Photoshop master pack you can see includes actually three other large packs. Um, I have my, my drawing set, my painting set, and really fun, my dirty ink set. Now, um, I've made uh, a couple of brush packs for Procreate in the past, which focus on dry media and drawing. Some of you might be familiar with those. And so this drawing set, drawing portion was really made, uh, inspired by those, not the same brushes, but very similar. Photoshop and Procreate have similar brush systems, but they are different. Um, and so I took advantage of Photoshop's unique features with all of these. Um, and so let me just kind of run through uh, on screen some of the drawings I've been creating with them. <laughs> Lots of figure drawings. So I have, a, I have a passion for figure drawing, especially with charcoal. Um, I, I used to, and still do it whenever I can, you know, draw from life as much as possible. And I just love charcoal. And here I tried to emulate um, charcoal and dry media and pencils as well as I could here with Photoshop tools. So here's a portrait. And this, this was using... Like which which brush were you using for this? So the, this one, several Same brushes one. in the uh, the charcoal section, and I'll run through those in a little bit. Okay. Because the the quality of it's just nuts. Getting to see the actual like texture of 
the paper through this. Yeah, I, I hope the stream yeah. shows it up. I know the stream will sometimes com compress detail a little bit, but mm -hmm. there is a lot of text. I'll try to zoom in here so you guys can see. This one's more about um, pastel. So I use my pastel brushes for this, this uh, portrait here. Um, pastel brushes, in my opinion, are kind of the, the middle ground between uh, like charcoal and painting because it really mm -hmm. is about working with color and texture. Let's scan through a few more drawings. This one, a uh, pencil sketch, a digital pencil sketch. I created a lot of pencils in this brush pack because I think of them as the uh, probably the most uh, flexible uh, tool. Um, again, I do lots of figure drawing. Mm -hmm. and I, I definitely utilize my pencils for them. The pencils are exceptionally good for uh, swiftly transitioning between broad strokes and um, sharp lines. And I'll try to demonstrate that a little bit in a few minutes. Another pastel. Again, usually just having fun with color and texture. Uh, the pack also includes paper surfaces, which I like to uh, open those up as a base, as a ground to work on top of. And in this one, uh, the paper color really helps to unify the image. It actually helps to speed up the process as well, because um, between all the strokes, the paper color and texture shows through. And so that, for one, it, it speeds you up because it means you don't have to cover every inch of the canvas. The paper does half the work for you. And also the color of the paper shines through as well, which helps to unify all the colors. Another charcoal portrait. Okay, so let me jump up now and let's look at the painting uh, images that I've done. And this is really where I spend most of my time, especially for professional work as an illustrator and concept artist. And so let me just zoom into a few of these. That looks great. And so for this, like, how, how long do you think that you actually spend on a piece like this? And yeah. what, how has that changed by you having your brushes versus using like a Photoshop mm. hard round? Yeah, well, it varies quite a bit. I mean, this one I think I spent probably about four or five days on, but this one's pretty big for me. I usually don't um, spend that much time. Um, I will say that certainly making my own brushes has sped me up a lot because naturally I'm much more familiar with them. Um, and that was uh, part of the... Uh, the urge to create me on my own set, you know, I've downloaded dozens and dozens of packs from other artists in the past. And while a lot of them are really great, I found that the majority to me are a bit disorganized. Um, I like, I would find like only half or so of the brushes are really useful to me. So um, I just eventually got to the point where I felt like, well, maybe I should just make my own pack and, you know, really make some brushes, craft some brushes that serve my, you know, personal needs as an artist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we've all had that that kind of like the issue where you buy some great brush pack where you see someone demonstrate them and then to try to like actually go through those brushes, they all have like the worst names, they're not organized yeah. by like how where you'll use them in the process. And so you're just trying to like scrub through the whole thing to find what the right shape kind of is. Right, exactly. Um, and uh, one of the, the great new features, and I guess it's been here a few years now, but it's still relatively new. Um, I'll just open uh, Photoshop here, is they have this great new brush system where you can sort your brushes into collapsible folders, just like a normal file system. And so you wouldn't believe it by looking at this little window here but there's over 600 brushes in the pack, but I can keep them very neatly organized with these folders. Mm -hmm. And I actually have like, uh, you know, two minds about brushes. On the one hand, I want just a few brushes that I'm very, very familiar with so that I can reach for them right away when I need them and I don't have to go searching. On the other hand, I get bored if I'm using the same tools all the time and I just like to have lots of brushes to play with. Mm -hmm. And so 
I have them. <laughs> I have <laughs> hundreds of brushes here to play with. Let me go okay. back here. Yeah, so lots of paintings, lots of portraits. Let me zoom in again. This one was fun. Um, so really playing with the um, the impasto texture of a brush here mm -hmm. and kind of this, letting yeah go ahead uh was this more of you actually painting direct to this and so the texture where there's like the missing areas where the canvas is showing through is that something that was made when you were doing your painting pass or was that scrubbed in afterwards it was a uh, kind of a bit of both in between i i don't tend to have a you know a very specific order of approaching things like that um, but in this case, I'm really like letting the texture kind of fill in the gaps. Um, it's doing a lot of the work for me in this case. Yeah, so portrait. Oh, the, the range of textures here. Yeah. For this figure drawing, I use lots of mixer brushes, which um, that's something I want to touch on later. I think mixer brushes are one of Photoshop's, um, you know, best features. And as far as I know, Photoshop is really the only uh, app that has uh, anything like it. So you know, there's, there's different strengths and weaknesses to all the different programs for their brush mm -hmm. emulation. But I do think Photoshop's made some big strides recently. Yeah. And I've been using Photoshop, I guess, for something like 15 years now. I I started using Photoshop when I was in high school in my first uh, graphic design classes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's kind of you know uncommon for any sort of technology or any app to be relevant for so many years, but uh, you know thankfully Adobe has been updating it, and it's still the industry standard. For most artists, mm -hmm. yeah. Even though I love I love other programs like um, Clip Studio Paint was great for their inks for a long time, uh, and obviously Procreate. And Photoshop has been the best one for my use because I get to mix between video editing, graphics editing, and so mm -hmm. much else all in one go. So, yeah, definitely. I, I think one reason I love Photoshop, even though it might lack some specific features that other tools have. For me, painting isn't just about using brushes. You know, it's largely about brushes, but it's also about editing. And there's really no better editing app than uh, the Photoshop. Mm -hmm. So, um, so let's look at the the dirty ink set. A few of the brushes I did for it, um, the images I did. Um, really, just having so much fun with inks. <laughs> and I'm the I'm the type of person who does not really love traditional inking because. You know, it re requires so much commitment. You can't really mm -hmm. edit. But with digital ink, I'm really enjoying it. I feel like it sort of um, frees me up to be a little bit more expressive and creative because it's really, you know, it simplifies the variables quite a bit when you're working in just black and white. You don't have to worry about a whole range of value or color. Um, you're really just working with shapes and lines, and there's so much you can do with just shapes and lines. Mm -hmm. And that's what ink really allows you to focus on. Um, so here's a more, wash in there. Yeah, uh, really have fun. Um, so most of the the inking brushes are pretty bold, like these uh, these dark lines here. But to balance that out, to complement those, I also have a lot of wash brushes so that you can get some nice tone and texture in the mix. But I, what I think is just fascinating is how using a different tool, um, using a different digital brush, really influences the way I approach an image, the way my mind sort of thinks and uh, goes about being creative or not. And so that's one of the things I want to you know, really explore with the demo I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'll just go ahead and jump over to that. OK, I'm going to go ahead and bring our faces back up while we hopefully okay. take some questions from people here. Uh, because this is the demo, so you'll be deep in it. But 
feel free to ask some questions, guys. Um, say say what, what you're curious about with the brushes or just what Lane does and how these actually apply to your workflow. Yeah, I'd I love guess. to have any questions related to tools or painting in Photoshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the thing. Um, so you said that you started making your own brushes because of a lot of the brushes not really working for your particular mm -hmm. workflow. Um, was there anything in particular that you felt needed to be addressed that you think is in this pack? Yeah, so that's actually a, a good point because uh, one of the things I wanted to show was um, kind of examples of common issues that I've had with brushes. Um, and so actually I made a few examples just sort of to exaggerate the issues so you guys can see. Um, like here's one, let me see. Um, one common and very annoying issue that you'll see with some brushes is um, I have a nice texture, but you'll see these really annoying seam lines pop up. Sometimes you'll just be painting and suddenly a seam will land right where you don't want it on a, on a precious detail. Mm -hmm. um, and this is you know pretty common. I exaggerated a bit here, so it's obvious, but this happens when the whoever the, made the brush didn't make a seamless texture. And making a seamless texture is a bit of an art to itself. I spent a ton of time on it. Uh, with this pack. And also, um, oftentimes you'll see low quality sort of uh, pixelated textures as well. So when you're like trying to work at a really grand scale and you want a really fine rendering and suddenly your texture of your brush is really pixelated, it messes everything up. So I've used very high resolution textures for these brushes and made them seamless so you don't get these issues. Let's see, another uh, common issue and a big thing about this pack. Um, so this is, you know, interesting brush shape, but it's it's very wide and and squat, and can't really control the angle of it at all. It also has kind of an ugly spacing to it. Again, I'm exaggerating it a little here, so it's obvious, but uh, you know, it's just not a very pleasing appearance. One thing I've done with my brushes is I designed them to take advantage of tilt control the pin so that you can rotate your hand to rotate the angle of the brush. So I have a lot of brushes that are very wide and flat, but they allow you to completely control that angle of that brush tip um, to fit wherever you need on your image. So you can, you know, without changing the brush size, size you can, you know, make a thin line or you can rotate it with your hand and make a, a broader stroke. Mm -hmm. And yeah, not that all that we don't have to just do pin pressure. Right, exactly. And it gives you more uh, natural, intuitive control. And while not all the brushes in the pack need or take advantage of that, most of them do. Um, so you need to make sure that you have a tablet that has tilt control sensitivity in order to utilize that. Most mm -hmm. tablets do, although some of the entry level tablets don't. So just be aware of that. Yeah, no, but it's definitely gotten a lot better in the last few years where most of them do, but there's still a couple out there that are selling some older models that don't. So yeah, watch out. Um, we do have a couple questions here. Sure. Um, so there's there's one that I think a couple people kind of asked a question that's similar to, um, but do you have like a main brush that you go to, uh, something that can be used mm. for like any situation? Or do you always end up varying it? Yeah, so uh, I would say I've organized my brushes here so that my most used brushes are at the top. And as you can see, hopefully it's large enough on screen. The, uh, the, the first folder I call the essential tools. And it's just the basic round brushes and other essential tools like sketch pencil. Use that all the time as obviously <laughs> for sketching and drawing. Um, I do have one brush here. I call the all-rounder because it is really just for, <laughs> it's an all-purpose brush, really. Um, it has some of the, the simple qualities of a round, you know, a classic round brush, but it also has the ability to generate texture as well. Like for instance, if I just tap it on the screen, I can get lots of texture, but if I'm just making strokes, I can get really smooth 
um, mm. soft gradients. And so, yeah, all purpose. Um, it's, it's called that name, people. It's right there. It's on the tin. <laughs> yeah. I spent hundreds of hours just, you know, really putting a lot of thought into these, these brushes and their arrangement. So even mm -hmm. though there's a ton of them in these folders, I, you know, I, through trial and error, through lots of work of my own, I tried to find the best place for them, uh, most practical, so so that I don't waste time because you can waste a lot of time uh, sifting through brushes. Mm -hmm. I also have the concept marker, which is what I've been using a lot lately of my uh, illustration work and concept art. Just a really nice sort of inky, um, fluid stroke, great for both broad um, tone and sharp lines. Nice. Yeah. Shape carver, great for blocking in you know, big mm -hmm. shapes with defined edges. I like the overlap too, where it actually, like, it actually is mimicking what you would get with the pigment overlap. Yeah, exactly. Nice. Um, scumble tool, so just a quick all-purpose texture brush. And really, you know, just for about anything where you just need a, a splash of texture. Particle spray, <clears throat> soft stroke. And I won't go through every brush because there's so many. Um, yeah, 600. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a lot. But anyways, like the point being, like the most used tools, the essential tools that I need to grab all the time are at the very top. Um, underneath that, I have the quick kit, which is actually, you know, kind of an expansion of the same idea. Basically, if I just need to hash out some concepts quickly, all the tools mm -hmm. I need for a full range of effects are right here at the top. You know, everything from smooth brushes to to highly textured brushes and, and whatnot. But then, of course, if you ever need anything more specific, that's what all the other folders are for. Okay. Um, what was what was your the the reference that you had for the demos that you're going to do today? Yeah. So let me jump. Was this to little that. guy? <laughs> all right. So yeah, I found this little creature, and for a while, I had no idea what he even was. Um, my wife said he looks like a spare parts animal. <laughs> like, a, you know, the, the, the platypus and some other creatures like that that just got made with leftover bits. Yeah, but you know what? I, I did some reverse image searching and found that he's a bandicoot. Oh, like so Crash. I, yeah, exactly. So I, I think he's like from Australia or something. He's a marsupial, which, you know what else is a marsupial? It's, oh, no. It's the, it's the kangaroo. A kangaroo it's is a the, marsupial. Just the worst. Man, I, so Stan's drawn so many kangaroos recently, trying to like offset this with some practice. <laughs> but, uh, the kangaroo also happens to be our promo code, right? Indeed. Oh, I, oh, I, did, I missed this one. You, you got me with the, the throw to the code. Yeah, the, actually, everything that's, that's, here, that's shown here today is going to be 20% off with the promo code kangaroo for the summer sale on Proco. Everything that's not um, something that's already on a pre-sale uh, is eligible for that 20% off. So for this one, uh, this actually brings this awesome 600 brush pack down to just $32 and I think 20 cents was what, 35, 20? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I'm gonna just uh, do a little exercise. Since the, this brush pack encompasses uh, drawing brushes, painting brushes, and inking brushes, I'm gonna do a little study here where I try to do a drawing of him, a painting and an inking, and that'll just give me an opportunity to uh, you know, demonstrate my process, talk about some strategies, and go through a few brushes. Um, you know, I definitely can't cover all these brushes, but I don't think you guys would want me to anyways, because I think part of the fun of a new brush pack is just kind of exploring them yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and everyone's going to use something different. So even if you go through it and you say, this is the brush that you use for this purpose, someone else is going to use exclusively an eraser intended brush right. to do something. <laughs> yeah. uh, I guess I'll just quickly run through the other folders, though, just as a quick overview. So um, under the quick kit, I have line brushes, which, as the name implies, they are for lines. Um, under that, I have the painterly brushes for all things illustration and painting, some of very traditional looking effects, others with relatively digital effects. Um, I have mixer brushes. 
Um, which, by the way, I did get a question earlier uh, that just asked me to, you know, talk about how mixer brushes work. So I guess I can quickly um, do that. So, like I said, I think mixer brushes are one of Photoshop's really uh, best um, features. Like, I, ca I can't go to another app and not have these. Um, I don't use them for everything, but especially when I want to get a, a painterly look and effect and just feel like I'm painting, um, these are wonderful. So essentially, they work just like your regular brushes, except they allow you to pick up multiple colors at once. And so let me put some colors down on the, the page first so I can demonstrate. So essentially, once you get some color down on your canvas, it allows you to hold Alt, the Alt key, the sample um, key. And your the shape of your brush becomes um, like a mask for uh, any area on your canvas. So wherever you select on your canvas, the shape of that brush uh, will, it'll pick up those colors. And you can move those around and just these wonderful oil-like painterly ways. Mm. And you know, almost every traditional painting you look at has something like this going on where the brush is pushing and pulling multiple colors at once. And, you know, especially when I'm doing like a study of John Singer Sargent, you know, Anders Zorn, you know, these wonderful oil painters, I find that it's almost essential to have the mixer brushes for that. Mm -hmm. And these do take a little bit of time to get used to, but I mean, I, I've kind of set them up with all the settings that I think um, work very well. Um, you should be aware though that the mixer brushes do tend to just be a little bit slower, um, a little bit laggier at times than uh, the normal brushes. That's just because Photoshop has to do a lot more computation with each stroke <laughs> as it's working with all these different colors. And so typically yeah. I, I save the mixer brushes for a later stage in a painting. When I, when mm -hmm. I want to fast and just put shapes down, I use normal brushes. And if I want the really painterly ooey gooey look, then I switch to these towards the end of the process. Yeah, that makes sense. Block in first and then go through and refine. Mm -hmm. All right, so under the mixer brushes, I have dry media brushes, which I'm gonna be using. You know, I have lots of pencils, um, charcoal, pastels, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, then the dirty ink set is underneath that. And I will also demonstrate that. So um, let me just start with this little study of this bandicoot. Yeah, and what, what is the pack that you'll be using to start with? So I'm going to jump to my pencils and the dry media. And so this is my first sketch of the day, just kind of a warm up. Um, just going to try and be pretty loose here as I get to know this creature. Mm -hmm. Just going to grab, let's see, uh, grab my graphite pencil. And typically with drawings, uh, I just like to start by just you know putting down some circles to kind of just represent the general mass of the subject. And I do this for just about everything, um, animals and figures, portraits. I'm not gonna be, try to be super accurate with any of these because to me, accuracy is really just a matter of spending time on something. Instead, I'm, I'm really just more interested in like trying to capture the uh, the, the character of this creature. <clears throat> yeah, I think a lot of people tend to get real caught up in the idea of having something be like entirely accurate with proportions rather than the suggestion of something. Even, even in fine art where someone was striving for actually accurate proportions, you still want to go for some idealization, a little mm -hmm. push, a little pull there to really just nail what the feeling is. Yeah, exactly. And I find that if I, I put myself in the mindset where I say, I'm not going to try and copy this. Instead, I'm going to try to maybe um, push it like 20%, you know, look at the character of it and push that character, exaggerate that, emphasize that 
about 20%. I find when I, I free myself up to kind of take that approach, um, it's a lot easier, it's a lot faster, I don't feel as stiff. And more often than not, I actually get closer to hitting the mark of accuracy than I otherwise would. Because if I'm, I'm super stiff and trying to be super accurate, it just it freezes me up. So let's see. Um, there were a couple other questions earlier. Um, so one person was asking, um, do you have watercolor or gouache brushes in this pack? Yes, I do have a set under the painterly brushes for emulating watercolor. Watercolor is a tough thing to to emulate digitally, but um, you know you won't have drips coming off the page. But I think that it's they're pretty darn good. I've been having some fun with those and uh, gouache. Yeah, I have some gouache light things. I think gouache as a medium, as a traditional medium, is actually very similar to digital as it is. Mm -hmm. um, the way it, it's so flexible allows you to layer things up in any order you want, uh, dries quickly. Um, so it has a lot of the same uh, attributes as digital painting. Mm -hmm. um, there was one person who was actually asking about digital versus traditional earlier. Um, they, they were saying that for them, it was kind of something that digital art is almost more for advertising, and that's pretty much it. As a person who's mm. working in concept art, um, I feel like you'll have a unique perspective on this one. I think that it's very different for you. Yeah, well, I think everyone you know comes to it with different you know needs, but I use digital for concept art, illustration, and just my own personal work just what I would call fine art. I don't know if you can call digital art fine art, but um, I do. Um, and I, I don't really, I mean, I don't have a preference really. I mean, I, I work with uh, traditional mediums as well. So to me, it's just like whatever medium I'm interested in the moment, whatever um, serves the job best, um, I'll use it. Yeah, I agree. I think that there's different strengths and weaknesses to all different media. Um, that That's whether you're comparing digital to traditional or even the things that are in traditional itself. Like you were saying with gouache, watercolor, all the different things, there's always some different tool that someone uses to either speed up their process or um, change their process. And that's, that's fine. Digital is good for being portable. Uh, easily shareable with collaborators, and I think uh, lowers the cost. So you don't have to worry about having to buy new paper every single time. Yeah. And I think uh, one thing that I, I personally feel like digital is a great way to learn to paint um, because mm -hmm. there are not so many um, hurdles in terms of cost. And, you know, mm -hmm. supply costs, the material costs. You know, you don't have to really f feel like you're wasting a canvas um, if you're not you know, doing your best work. And just have at it. There's, you know, there's really a loss to making a bad image. You just delete it and try again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't have to breathe turpentine, so that's great too. Oh yeah, that, that's. Good. I really appreciate that part. <laughs> Um, there's a person who was asking about the brushes for erasing in here. Um, if there are eraser brushes and if you use something that's not in this pack for erasing. Yeah, so great question. I definitely have lots of erasers. And um, for me, it's very important to create erasers um, that work well with traditional looking techniques. You know, So obviously, if I'm trying to create a nice traditional looking drawing. And if I use a hard round eraser, that's immediately going to break the illusion. Mm -hmm. It's immediately going to look super digital, which you know, isn't always a bad thing. Sometimes you just want to say, OK, this is, this is digital image. I'm going to make it look digital. But uh, uh, I also have other brushes, like I have a natural eraser that I'm using right now, um, which gives you a much more natural looking edge when you erase. Absolutely. 
yeah like so there's all there's still remnants left under there like it would be if you were yeah exactly it's not it's not a perfect erase it it leaves some there and Mm -hmm. unless you really press down um it gives you a little bit of texture as well um when i do the inking in a a few minutes um, i'm going to be using the keen eraser which goes well with inking um it, it gives me a much sharper um edge much cleaner um stroke but also a little bit of texture in there as well mm-hmm. but yeah lots of variety there i uh, don't really have time to go through all of them but i think you'll have fun exploring those yeah okay um so i guess what were the kinds of things that you found yourself having the biggest hard time with um using stock brushes in different programs Was it just you wanting to make it look more realistic or was it actually hindering the flow of things that you had to go through and like cut into things with textures? Yeah, well, uh, I found that most stock brushes aren't really the best, exa- you know, aren't really the, the best examples to work with. Usually they feel a little clunky. Uh, I mean, with Photoshop, obviously you have the basic round brushes, which um, mm-hmm. I use all the time. Um, because they're just so essential uh, depending on what you're working on. Um, But a lot of the other brushes are just a little too clunky, don't really feel very natural. So yeah, yeah, let me jump back to my graphite pencil here. Okay. Even though we're doing the the graphite and pencil portion of things, um, there was one question here about painterly looks to digital work. Um, so there were, the person was asking if it comes down to practicing with the brushes and tools, um, or do you think that the tool makes like a big difference itself? Well, one thing I, I definitely want to demonstrate with this exercise here is that your choice of brush has a huge effect on what the image looks like. And, uh, it, you know, it's largely because every stroke you make after the first stroke you put down um, is influenced by the stroke that came before it. Mm-hmm. So brushes have, in my uh, opinion, a huge effect on how I draw and paint. Um, what was that question again? I lost my train. Uh, so they were just saying, they were kind of asking if it's that whether it comes down to just practicing and trying to learn those tools, oh, yeah. or if it's something that's impacted by the tools themselves. Yeah, so like I said, the the tools have a big impact, but when you're trying to get uh, a traditional look, a lot of it is about just taking a traditional approach, Um, which is someone who does use traditional tools, I I tend to lean in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, just as I'm doing this pencil sketch here, I'm basically taking the same approach as I would a pencil on paper. So by taking the same approach, it's naturally gonna help me to have similar results. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you take something wildly different or if you take an approach that you simply would be impossible to do with traditional media, um, it's naturally going to tend to look more digital, which, like I yeah. said, isn't always a bad thing. I mean, I think sometimes it's it's really great to just celebrate digital looking digital um, mm-hmm. as its own unique medium. Yeah, I think like uh, we've we've also seen that kind of push in things like film recently, where uh, tons of different films are trying to look very film looking, like uh, with the way the light interacts with stuff. But then you also have something like the John Wick films that are just unapologetically digital uh, and super sharp, and both of them have their strengths. The same thing goes for making paintings or drawings. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so there's, there's another question here that we've gotten a couple different things like, um, so for this particular thing that you're working on right now, your, um, the three little canvases that you have and the reference are shown on screen, those are in this Photoshop doc. It's not you using pure ref. Right, right? yeah, this is all in Photoshop. And, and, then, and I do use, usually I do use pure ref quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I have three screens up and I love having multiple monitors so that I can put up loads of reference around me. Um, Uh, When you go to just sit down and start drawing something, 
uh, or painting something in Photoshop, what would you say is your base canvas? Like if it's, canvas you don't know size. what you're going to make and it's not for delivering to a client or anything, how does that really start for you? Yeah, so uh, the great thing about digital is it is so flexible. You can always change the canvas at any point later. Mm -hmm. So I will typically just start with a pretty large, um, you know, typically I like to work at, at least like 3,000 pixel resolution. But lately I've been working more like 5,000, 6,000. 6, um, one thing I will note is that some, some brushes don't perform well if you're working at a super low resolution. Um, mm. And so if you're ever feeling like the brush is just, it's not flowing, uh, often resolution is the issue. And so just work on a larger uh, canvas. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I have a fairly new computer. Um, and so I, I work on large canvases and and don't really worry about much else. If I need to crop it at any point, I can do it later. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, there's a person here asking, maybe you have a specific answer for this one. And they said, when I use your smudge tools on an area, it mixes with the pixels from the separate background layer. It doesn't retain, retain transparency. Am I doing something wrong? So that is a setting that uh, you can toggle. To my smudge tool. Um, so up here, when you have your smudge tool selected at the top, you can see a checkbox that says sample all layers. And now I typically like to have this on because like a traditional painter, I like to be able to manipulate all my layers at the same time with my smudge tools. And uh, same with mixer brushes. Um, that will you know, allow you to edit all the layers underneath at once. Typically, I like this. But if you don't like that for some reason, you just uncheck that. And it will only affect the layer you're using. <clears throat> I guess so. If you're if you're using the pencil brushes, is there anything that you think um, you're most happy to have emulated well with brush packs? Yeah, is so that transition it, from thick to thin kind of behavior. Yeah. So the pencils, um, and I'm using it a bit here. You can see I'm I'm using the same brush, and you can see I'm jumping back and forth between you know a fine line, and broad strokes and this mm -hmm. is what i really look for drawing um that speed and efficiency that i get because i i like to be able to cover a lot of ground and also define edges at the same time and on a you know just on an abstract level i think it looks really nice to have sort of a balance of broad soft edges and mm -hmm. sharp crisp lines. Um, what I've found is like one of the best ways if you feel like your your drawing is 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 not quite looking good um, is just to address the edges. Um, try to come in and have broad rounded edges, such as in this case, you know, I'm working on the back of this creature, this furry creature. Mm -hmm. So that that broad back, I'm gonna have this broad soft stroke across that to represent that transition between light and shadow side. Um, but like right next to that, the contour edge here over the back, I want to have a nice sharp line. And so on an abstract level, I'm constantly looking at the relationships of edges like that. Yeah, it makes a big difference for something feeling like realistic, like something that's actually tactile. I think getting to have all those different things in one, where so many different brushes, if you go to use them, it feels like it's something that was made digitally. And again, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just about getting your intended result. Yeah. What do you think is the most important characteristic of this happy little uh, bandicoot? Yeah, well, I, I like his, you know, his hunched over, um, almost kangaroo-like posture. Mm -hmm. So I really need to emphasize that. 
yeah so this is like my first drawing so i'm kind of warming up getting to know this creature And I guess, um, honestly, no one's asked this question here so far, but um, what kind of tablet do you use most often? Are you using a screen tablet that you draw directly onto or something like more like an Intuos? So I use, uh, let me bring up a photo. Um, I use an Interest Pro, a Wacom Interest Pro. And uh, here I have a little photo, of, a few photos of my desk set up. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the, the only unique thing about it really, it's nothing special, is that I, I've set my tablet up on a slant, on a board that's slanted, um, almost like a drafting table. I find that this feels a little bit more comfortable than it lying flat. My arm doesn't have to quite reach as far with this slant, so it's really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, and um, another thing that I want to point out uh, is that for my hotkeys, I use a gaming keypad called the Razer Nostromo. Now, this is actually an older model, um, but it's been working fine for 10 years, so I'll stick with it. <laughs> um, but it's, it's so convenient because I can, I can bind my most used keys to these keys right underneath my hand. So my hand doesn't have to go uh, wandering across my tablet to my keyboard looking for keys. Um, speeds me up a ton. Honestly, I don't know if I could work without it. Mm -hmm. It also fits very nicely next to my tablet on the side. So as far as desk space goes, it's very convenient for that as well. Mm -hmm. um, I use, I guess one unique feature is the scroll wheel I use for zooming in and out. I really like that. And you'll probably see me zooming in and out a lot, maybe a little too much. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm just kind of got used to it that way. I like to feel like I have a lot of control to, to step back, step away from my image at any moment to kind of get a different perspective. And so that makes it very easy. The, uh, the thumbstick, the D-pad, I use for um, changing the brush size. So I just knock that up with my thumb if I want to increase the brush size, knock it down mm -hmm. if I want to reduce it. And so that's really fast, really um, intuitive, feels like I have control versus just you know pressing a key or um, button on the screen. This tactile control really makes me feel a bit more engaged with the mm -hmm. tools. Um, another little thing, and this is something I got fairly recently, is this, this big fat grip for my pen. Uh, it's a little pricey, I admit, um, but this is the page on Amazon. Um, I was having a bit of wrist pain and um, pain in my hand just from gripping the pen for so many hours a day. And uh, I found that this really helped to alleviate that. Um, it also, because it's so broad, it feels like it gives me a little bit more um, control over the rotation of the brush. I just have a little bit more... Um, leverage, I suppose, mm -hmm. over the, the angle of the pin because of that extra whip. So just a personal thing I like, but you definitely don't have to have that or this. Um, but yeah, I like seeing what other artists use, you know, what tools they use. So these are mine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, personally, I think the only things that I have bound to anything, they're all just on a little external numpad. Uh, and so usually I'll just have that off to the side to just tap away on things. Um, I, for a long time, I used a, a separate trackpad with two little mouse buttons uh, in the same kind of way that you're using the scroll for. And it just got to be something that you would string with a couple different key presses. Um, so let's see. Oh, there's someone who is asking about rotating the brush again. I think there's nothing that you're doing that manually rotates the brush uh, besides using those the dynamics of the pen. Yeah, it's all in the rotation. Again, that's the tilt sensitivity of the pen, mm -hmm. um, which you can buy. There's for Wac Wacom has what they call an art pen, which is actually specially designed to have rotation control, which I have that. And for a while, I thought I had to have that. Um, but then I realized uh, after playing around with these brushes that tilt control works just as well and maybe even a little better 
um, than the rotation control of that special pin. Um, so I've been taking full advantage of it. Mm -hmm. I honestly have not seen any other brush packs that take advantage of that tilt control feature um, to this extent. So if you don't know what we're talking about, you probably never used it. <laughs> um, it's kind of, it's almost like a hidden feature in Photoshop's press system. Uh, there's a person here who's asking if you've had trouble with um, any sort of like RSI, um, repetitive stress injuries. Um, they, I get, you were saying that you had some, some yeah. wrist pain and things. So it sounds like something that you've been watching for. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't know exactly what my particular issue would be called. I never like, it never got so bad that I had to go to a doctor for it or anything, but there'd definitely be like times where I'm uh, working for hours and hours every day on a project and I find my, my wrist starts aching. Um, even just making simple brush strokes might start to feel painful. Um, and so whenever that starts to happen, I know it's, it's time to take a break for a little while, get up mm -hmm. and stretch. Stretching your wrist and your hands and your whole arm is actually very important. Um, all the nerves in the arm are kind of connected and you kind of got to move them around if you start to feel some pain. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, somebody's asking if, if you, they think that it's a good idea to warm up before getting started on a painting or just hopping right into it. First, yes, definitely do some, some stuff. The, you have to get the get out the bad movements of what your wrist and body and imagination will do. Um, do you have any particular things that you choose to do? Uh, nothing particular, but but definitely I feel stiff when I'm starting my first image. Like this one's a little bit stiff right now, um, a little bit slow, um, but that's okay. You know, my first images of the day always are, and usually I don't really start to get the swing of things and start to feel fluid until a few hours in. Yeah, it, it takes a little bit. I, there are different exercises that you can do, um, just you know, practicing your ellipses, like everyone has, uh, um, drawing some straight lines. Uh, and there's actually a whole portion of that in the Drawing Basics course that we're doing, uh, as well as on the YouTube uh, in the shorts that we post. Just make them a little easy for you to go through and do in under a minute. Um, I think that a person's asking, how do so many digital artists not wear eyeglasses? Um, you can zoom in. It's okay. Uh, don't like if you if you're struggling to see the thing that you're working on, something's wrong, uh, and you got like three different avenues to try to address this one. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I've been pretty thankful that my eyes have held up thus far. Mm -hmm. But there are times when, yeah, I kind of got to take a break just to, to get away from the screen. Screen time can really put some strain on your eyes and put you in a bad mood. And I mm -hmm. um, also always try to have a bit of light in my studio beyond the screen. Absolutely. Yeah, and having having a, a little bit of light on just a wall behind you or something like that, it really eases the stress of you looking at one bright thing the whole time. It's like when you, when you use your phone camera to try to take a picture of something, um, your camera will try to um, kind of set the exposure to the brightest thing. Um, this, your eyes do the same thing. Uh, so don't make your eyes have to work too hard to balance what's in front of you. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, yeah, so how long did you want to spend on each of the demos here? I know that I'll obviously have to ask a bunch of different questions, but we could get into a spot where... Uh, yeah, I don't want to... I want to get to all of them if possible, so I probably need to move on. Yeah. If you guys do have any particular questions about any of the brush packs that we will show or that we have shown that you don't feel that, that got addressed, please bring them up. Um, but after these pencils, what would be the next one that you would want to show? All right, so now I'm going to jump to a painting. A little bit loosened up now, and I'm a little bit more familiar with my subject. So let me just drag my reference down. And by the way, this is how I like to do studies and exercises in general. 
Um, I like, and I think this is a good exercise for forcing my brain to look at this subject differently each time and look at it different in different ways. Um, so with the painting approach, I'm going to go a little bit differently. I'm going to grab my, my wash brush. Now let me go over to a different page here. Um, this is a tool that I, I personally really enjoy, and it's just for laying down the initial wash, the initial um, tone on my canvas. Um, I find that it's much easier to work into and begin painting when I have a little bit of splash, a little bit of texture, a little bit of value on the page. And so I made this brush specifically for that. It's really broad and really quickly covers the whole canvas. Mm -hmm. Just a gentle, organic looking texture. So it has a little bit of color variation built in. Um, so you won't just have just a flat tone. But it's a very organic. And this is very similar to how a lot of oil painters or traditional painters in general like to start, you know, toning a canvas as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with that here um, and just, you know, talk about my general approach to painting from observation. And I think the key is to keep it simple and don't get ahead of yourself. One of the best ways to do that is to zoom out. Zoom out and kind of treat it like a little thumbnail study initially. Make it really small on your screen. It feels far less intimidating. You can cover a lot of ground um, with less effort. So I'm going to grab my painting brushes now. Let's see here. Um, so at the top of the legendary brushes list, you know, I have some cool names here, don't I? Um, <laughs> I have <laughs> the Forager, which um, is just like a nice block-in brush. Um, great for getting big swabs of color and has a little bit of texture. It's fairly soft overall, although if you press down um, with a little bit of pressure, you can get some nice sharp edges as well. And this is one, one of the key things I, I had in mind with these brushes is I want them to be versatile. I want to be able to get as much of a full range of effects out of each one as possible. So this one, I can get these really soft gradients. At the same time, I can get these nice sharp shapes as well. So. Mm -hmm. Very, very flexible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, when I'm painting, I always like to start with the um, the environment or the background of the subject. A uh, person was asking just while you're here, laying this like base part. Um, they were asking, how can I tell if it's the brushes I need and not some setting that I need to change about the software to get the same movement? Like others have this flowing feel to it. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty vague question to me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As a person who is as um, choosy and selective about the brushes that you use, I don't know if you'd had a, have a general answer for this, but I think that honestly, the the main thing is just to see if you are getting the results that you want from those tools. Um, because what works for someone else from the tool, whatever the strengths of those tools are, might not be the same strengths for you. Uh, as long as you're not going broke buying a bunch of brush packs or trying different software tools, try around, see what yeah. works best for you. Um, what's where someone might say that um, the the inkers the like the ink brushes that are in Procreate are the best things they've ever used. That might be just because that's how it works for them. Um, you might need to use something else, and that's okay. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, feel free to explore and try all the different software and tools, and just mm -hmm. and get some experience. So you can you know, find what works for you and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Also, if you're really early in trying to learn art and do art in a more um, quote unquote serious manner, 
um, you might not necessarily know what works best for you yet. And that's also very okay. Uh, some people get real committed to brush pens in the beginning of working, um, like doing art more seriously. But later on, you find that you can do the same things with even just the most basic of tools like a pencil. Uh, there was another person who was asking, um, they had been eyeing your course on in CGMA. Do you think it's worth it for a beginner? Yeah, so I teach a digital painting course on CGMA, CG Masters Academy. Um, and it really is just, uh, it's geared towards all levels, I like to say, because it, it focuses on the fundamentals of painting. And everyone, no matter what level you're at, you benefit from coming back and focusing on the fundamentals. But it is definitely primarily geared for uh, um, people new to digital painting, and it you know goes over the very basics at the start, um, and then gets into more advanced stuff towards the later lessons. Okay, um, and then there's a person who is asking, "Can you make a video about making concept art? Um, do you think that that kind of thing might work out for them to address what they're looking for?" Uh, the CGMA course? Yeah. Um, the CGMA course is not so much on concept art. Certainly, you can get some some valuable, uh, you know, exercises out of it. But it's primarily just more towards the fundamentals of painting, like mostly like working from observation, understanding how to control light and shadow, and um, painting different materials. Um, Shape design is a big subject. Uh, is there any sort of course that you do anywhere? That um, I, I would some? like to branch out into other subjects, but right now it is just that um, basic painting class. Okay. Um, someone had asked if you were planning to translate your inking and painting brushes to procreate at all. I would like to at some point, but it is a ton of work, um, especially when I have so many brushes. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I don't have any immediate plans for that. And then partly I'll just say it's because Photoshop is my go-to software for that kind of work. I, I really love Procreate, um, especially as a middle ground between traditional drawing in a sketchbook and uh, digital painting. But when it comes to professional work and you know sitting at my my computer for hours each day, I really feel like Photoshop um, is best suited. It lets me have these big screens in front of me, um, my tablet in a comfortable position, a nice chair, um, versus uh, Procreate where you kind of have to hunch over the tablet for a while. Mm -hmm. um, so that's primarily why I made these brushes for Photoshop because it's just, it's the tool I prefer to use for them. And like I like I've already mentioned, like it has some unique features, like the organization is really key. Like there's no way you could deal with this many brushes in Procreate uh, without these these folders. I would just be way too cumbersome. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, with you talking about the monitors being able to be in front of you versus having to look down at a screen, uh, someone had asked about your monitors. They asked how important is it to look into the specs. Um, like uh, having the correct color profile and backlight, different things like that. Have you, have you found this making a big difference? Do you spend a lot on your monitors? Well, I definitely think it's important to get quality screens. Mine are not the super high end ones. Like you can get some that are like designed for, you know, perfect color accuracy for design work, and they're like three thousand dollars or something. Um, mm -hmm. But mine are more like in the $500, $400 range. Um, so they're IPS screens. They have good color accuracy. I think they're all Dell. Yeah, they're all Dell brand. Um, mm. And yeah, they work great. Um, not super expensive. Um, definitely don't want to you know, have a cheap budget screen because they will often you know not have great color accuracy and what your the colors you see on your screen might be completely different than what others are seeing mm -hmm. yeah and if you're spending a bunch of time trying to really nail the colors of something to have it just look so wildly different at the end of the process when you you send it to a friend or something 
and they're like, oh, it looks really cool. And you, you see it on their phone uh, and you're like, no, that, that looks like trash. Why does your phone make it look like that? It might be you. <laughs> like your display does make a big difference. Like don't, don't go broke, but it's, it's okay to, to know that your monitor isn't necessarily. Yeah. Broke. And everyone, you, know, you, have, you have to start simple, you know, especially if you're <laughs> young, um, whatever tools you have access to, that's, that's where you have to start. And don't feel like you have to, you know, invest a ton of money before you can even begin practicing because yeah. you don't. I, I start off on a really slow computer and a really small, a really small screen where everything was cramped. Um, but I, I made a lot of progress because I, I didn't worry too much about it. I made the most of what I had. Absolutely. Yeah, there, like back in the day when someone was going to make the finest of art, they didn't have some crazy tools. Are they still managed to make good art? You can too. Mm -hmm. um, someone was asking about some of your modern artists that you found inspiration from. You mentioned um, Sargent earlier. Yeah, you know, so many inspirations, both from past and present. Um, to name, honestly. I'm definitely influenced a lot by um, traditional artists. Um, I, you know, I just love getting painterly. I love, I love paintings that look like they were fun to paint. And so to me, that usually means paintings that are, have, you know, broad, um, energetic brushwork, um, and that aren't too tedious, you know, that don't look like they took forever to do. A little, real quick on what I'm doing right now. You can see I kind of started with a ball. It's a ball of fur, basically. Um, I'm trying to simplify this creature down to its most simple form first. And then I'm now kind of branching out and adding or structure and anatomy to it. Mm -hmm. I find that starting with a simple sphere or you know whatever basic shape kind of represents subject is a great way to start. It takes away a lot of the intimidation of trying to get all the features at once. And it allows you to go ahead and establish a sense of light and shadow on the form in its most simplest uh, representation. And once you have those values and colors down, it is then very, well, much easier to then um, expand on that. I really like to think of it as like working with clay. You know, you, when you start with a, uh, anything with clay, you're working with, you start with a big formless shape, a big ball. Um, and so it's very much the same idea. I very much agree. I think that it's it's a great way to make sure that you're moving in the right direction before trying to actually expand that form and get more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a person who is asking. Um, they they had they have problems matching colors with the reference dig, um, when they're working digitally. Is there a way to do that without using the color picker? So a lot of that just comes with experience. Um, uh, the more practice you have of picking colors naturally, the more accurate you're going to get with it. Um, for me, I just know that I'm never going to pick the perfectly accurate color right away. Um, it's always about choosing a, a general color that you feel is roughly correct, putting it down, and then deciding which direction do you need to to go with it? Do you need to go lighter or darker with the value? Do you need to go warmer or cooler with the color temperature? Those are decisions you can only make after you put the mark down. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to just start somewhere. Don't expect to grab the perfect color right away. Yeah. And either, I mean, it's a, a tale as old as time for a person to select like a skin tone or something off of someone in a picture that they're trying to reference. And then turns out that one color doesn't necessarily, it's not emblematic of the overall skin of the person. Uh, so they end up making a bit of an error in this. 
Um, so just as a reminder to everyone, one of the reasons that we're doing this stream is because there is a summer sale right now. So this super awesome 600 brush brush pack um, is on sale. Uh, it's 20% off right now with that code Kangaroo. Um, hence the marsupial, marsupials because Wayne's awesome. Um, and so if you guys want to save on this brush pack for Photoshop or any other brush packs of lanes that work for Procreate, um, those can all be found on Proco. I'll drop a little bit of a link here. Um, yeah, that, that also works for the different courses that we have. Um, you can save 20% off, which makes a big difference. Times are tough. Um, there were a couple other questions here. Uh, one person said, uh, I enjoy artwork and designs, and I want to draw lifelike portraits. What and who would be the best options for me to begin my art career? Um, you don't necessarily have to use Proco, but Proco <laughs> does have a lot of courses. Um, we have a lot of courses online. Um, I don't know, for, uh, for Lane, you have some courses on some other places uh, that you had mentioned. If a person wanted to kind of keep up with where you might be putting out any educational resources, where would they find you on socials? Yeah, so uh, I will announce anything that I do on Instagram. You can find me lane.draws on Instagram. Um, like I said, I would definitely like to branch out and do some more uh, courses or lessons on different subjects um, in the future. Mm -hmm. Now that I have these brushes out of the way, that's probably going to be my next Is there any sort of topic that you want to tackle most? Is that a concept art kind of topic or something else? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm interested in a lot of topics. Um, I would definitely want to focus on some fundamentals because I mean, personally, whenever I'm teaching fundamentals, I think of it as, um, well, a good excuse for me to practice them. And, and I think it's a, important for artists at any stage to come back and practice fundamentals. So anything I can do to kind of encourage myself to do that, um, I try to do. Um, definitely on other topics like uh, portraits. Um, I do a lot of uh, character concept work as well would be a fun subject. <clears throat> Um, lots of drawing, like uh, my my Instagram was kind of built on figure drawing. Um, do a lot of that, um, so there's a lot I could talk about there. Mm -hmm. um, so for you, what are the best places that you find good references for things? I don't know if this particular marsupial definitely uh, necessarily came from your favorite resource places. Um, but uh, are there anything, is there anything that you use most often? Well, this one came off Pinterest and I use Pinterest <laughs> a lot. It's a great way to just explore, you know, it's, it's great at recommending things that are similar to whatever you're mm -hmm. searching. Um, so I, I definitely use it a lot. Um, just about everything. Okay. Yeah. Pinterest um, is a pretty big go-to for a lot of people. Uh, the the person who had asked the question had specifically asked for uh, anything besides Pinterest. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, well, uh, if I'm looking for images that other people aren't using, mm -hmm. one of the problem with Pinterest is that everyone kind of uses the same reference when they go in there. Um, I'll go on the Flickr. Flickr is an older website mm. um, dedicated to photography. Um, and there's a ton of images on there, anything you can imagine, especially anything related to like nature. I need reference of any sort of animal or landscape. Um, Flickr is usually a good place to go. Mm -hmm. I really like the ears you got in here. I think you, you've nailed the characteristics <laughs> of these ears and a little bit of fall off kind of into the background is good. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm trying to get sort of a chunky look and let some edges just be loose and um, mix in with the background. Yeah, I think that's, that's definitely your work um, that I've gotten to see over time has definitely shown um, like this great example of color and shape 
uh, and you'll choose to idealize. And I think the places that also work best for me, uh, it's good to see. Yeah, I, I really, I've been inspired a lot lately by, um, there's this one artist, her name is Carol Marine. She wonderful oil paintings, mostly still life um, subject matter. She uses these wonderful chunky brush strokes. And, and, and rather than focusing on detail, it's more about shape design. Mm -hmm. And that's really what has been inspiring me lately. Because I know that I could always spend hours and hours on an image, adding more detail, making it look more realistic. But usually, to me, it doesn't make it more interesting. The interest usually comes from the relationships of uh, values and color and edge qualities and the, the general shape design. And that aspect doesn't have to take a ton of time mm -hmm. or about the thought you put into it. I very much agree. Yeah, I think if you if you nail a thing in the beginning with the right shapes, then that sh that shows through at the end, where you can only add so many details and greeblies on that last little bit of something, and it won't make that big of a difference. Yeah. Um, the person had asked for reference. Um, do you store them, or do you go and find your reference each time? And if you do store them, do you use anything in particular? Uh, I mean, I have I have a lot of images saved in just my general reference library. Um, so if I and that's kind of good to have. I think it's good to collect images so that when you need something, you can jump right to it. You don't have to go searching. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly uh, looking for new things as well. Yeah, they mentioned um, a very <laughs> a big uh, German word here. They said, uh, do you use only pure ref for it or some sort of Zettelkasten note method? Mm -hmm. I don't know what that is. I, yeah. I don't know about you. Know that either. I definitely use pure ref. Mm -hmm. um, Super um, easy. Well, just one note on pure ref real quick is that um, what I found works well since I'm constantly jumping from one project to another, you know, from between um, professional work and personal work. And I often find that I like to just use one ref board and toss all my projects up on it. Um, so whenever I'm moving to a different project, I just, you know, uh, move to a different cluster of images on the ref board. Mm -hmm. much faster than having to constantly sort through different files. Yeah, it, it makes a big difference. Like you said, with wanting to even have those reference images stored in the first place, one of the biggest things for that is that you don't want to have to add any additional hurdles. Yeah. Um, what I is our time looking like? Am yeah, I, I was actually just about to say this. Um, yeah, right now we've got about 40 minutes left in that original okay. budgeted two hours. So I don't know if you want to go to inks. Yeah, let me just spend a little bit more time refining this painting. It's definitely not going to be a finished painting. And, and that's okay, because sometimes I think the more interesting things aren't finished anyways. <laughs> yeah. I, there is a story that I read uh, recently. I think it was, uh, there's there's an author, um, they had written this book, ends entirely unfinished. Um, and it ends like in the middle of a sentence that's like, and she said to me, and then it ends. It's like, it's this, this big wow. buildup of like, what she said to me was the most important thing that she would ever say. And then, bop, and the person died. <laughs> that's fine. So I think that there's something too, not uh, not necessarily knowing what the end was. But it leads, leave it. and that is very similar to what I think good paintings do. They kind of leave some areas undefined, mm -hmm. but they kind of, they give you enough information to inspire your imagination to, to help it fill in those gaps. Exactly. Yeah. Because if, if everything is right there on the page, it doesn't have, it doesn't become personal to you. 
if you look at something and your imagination gets to fill in the gaps, chances are it's probably the most ideal fill-in for what you want to see. Mm -hmm. I guess, is it, does anyone have, um, have any other questions about um, what brushes are included in this pack, um, how you could use these, um, or even just general, I guess, Photoshop tips here. Um, for Bunny Wild, um, the stream will be available as a VOD afterwards, yeah. When I'm at this stage of a painting, I try to remind myself that I don't necessarily need to add more complexity. Often it's better to just to force myself, spend a little time pushing and pulling the shapes I already have on the page mm -hmm. and refining them. It's very rare that adding more complexity actually um, enhances the image or solves any problems. Yeah, this is definitely true. I think it's something that a lot of newer art students get caught up in a lot. They want to spend a long time really honing in those details. But at the end of the day, I think one piece of advice that I that I've found to always be true is that the thing that you view at like 400 times scale that you're really getting into the details of, if you zoom so far away from that and look at it like 10% scale, that's how anyone else is going to see it. Those extra two little tufts of fur that you really like nailed uh, having little individual hairs on, people don't typically see those things. Yeah. Like it's not necessarily worth um, spending your time on those things when you could just you know, focus on nailing the piece in the first place. Um, we got a question here. They're asking, do you use the master brushes such as the Zorn and Sargent brushes in your own personal work, or do you primarily use those brushes when you're studying the work of those artists? Yeah, definitely both. Um, but for those not familiar, I have a whole folder here called the master brushes, which are inspired by some of my favorite masters, such as John Singer Sargent, Anders Zorn, Walter Everett, um, Waterhouse, um, Lion Decker, Frazetta, you know, all these fun people. And definitely, you know, they are inspired by their unique work and um, mart making. And I feel like it can be very difficult to emulate their style without mm. um, the sorts of brushes. Um, but I, I, you know, I use them for everything. Um, if I'm, I just want to be very painterly, then I'll use some Sargent and Zorn, you know. I think there might be there might be a, a, a Proco brush somewhere. Yeah, so there is a Proco but... pencil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we use pencils so much. Which, if I could just say, as a person making art instructional videos, having a highly reflective graphite thing that we're mostly recording, not great, not well, great. <laughs> now that is one thing I've I've always disliked about traditional media, especially oil painting, um, hanging on a gallery is the glare mm -hmm. uh, of, you know, just off the reflective surface, the glare can sometimes be so obtrusive that yeah. it makes it difficult to even appreciate the image. Yeah. And I guess it's something you just get used to as a traditional artist who primarily paints digitally. Um, I still haven't quite gotten past that. Yeah, it's a big hurdle. Um, a person was asking if these are available for uh, for Krita users. Um, I think the the pretty standard response that we're going with for most um, softwares is that you can try to load the brushes into those. Um, you won't get all of the characteristics of them that are some of their strengths. Yeah, so Photoshop has some you know unique brush system features that I took full advantage of this set. Um, and so while you definitely, you know, you probably can import these brushes into other apps, I just would not advise it. I don't expect them to work as intended. Some mm -hmm. of them might work fine. And I have heard from some people that they do work quite well and procreate. But uh, like I said, Photoshop is my go-to for this sort of work. And this is really what they were designed for. I think one of the main hurdles 
again, it's like, there's just so many brushes. And so unless the other app has a good way of organizing them, it's going to be a um, mess. A person had asked, uh, do you think you could successfully um, get a sense of mixed materials with this brush set, um, like watercolor or alcohol markers over the inks? Yeah, I think you could if you uh, take a mindset, you know, take a similar approach and strategy to using those tools. That is really important. If you want a traditional look or a very specific look of some sort, then you have to take a similar approach. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes what makes something look the way it does is simply the, you know, the method and the order in which you approached it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a person asked, uh, is it better to stick to one software for your career or keep using multiple ones? I think that's totally personal. Um, you know, don't be afraid to use whatever you enjoy. I find for me, I'm, I mean, I'm pretty much totally a 2D artist. And so Photoshop handles pretty much everything I need. Yeah, I think. You should definitely try not to make um, yourself be stuck with just one piece of software. Um, you don't necessarily have to go and learn every new piece of software. That's that's crazy. But uh, compare and contrast what the people that you respect the opinions and ideas of um, online when they try to talk about a new piece of software becoming a piece of their workflow. See if it works for you. Uh, if it works cost wise, but you can just stick with one piece of software uh, unless the field that you go into necessitates you using something else. I think that'll probably be one of the biggest things. So to quickly sort of make this a little bit more finished, what I often like to do is draw on top of it. Um, let me grab a different brush. I'll use the maybe contour. This is the, the spider the spider verse approach. Yeah. Um, so a painting will often feel kind of mushy and unfinished when you're just using big broad strokes. And so one way I found to quickly um, add a sense of finish and detail to it is to kind of just draw on top of it. So I'm going to take a, a smaller brush and I'm going to come in and just begin to lay some lines here and there. Um, to sharpen, to quickly sharpen some of these edges. Um, little details like the whiskers, for instance, I need a nice um, sharp brush like this. Fun. I find that in order for a painting to, to kind of feel finished, you need a, a good range of, of a detail from the big strokes to the tiny little intricate details. Uh, those intricate marks are more just like creating the impression of detail. Again, I'm not trying to be too tight here, but <laughs> this, these lines like here on the nose, like very quickly help to create the impression of some detail and some tightness there. Add a little bit of tufts of fur, some fur, uh, flying hair on the back. This when you go through with some of these smaller brushes, are these pulling from different sections of that brush pack? Yeah, I have so many here, but I'm right now I'm using the concept marker. I think it's really it's a really fluid brush, so great for this. Yeah. Um, one person had said in the chat here, they were asking if it's confusing to balance all of these different brushes. Um, is there anything that you feel about this? Well, I definitely recommend that you just get to know a few at a time. And there's way too many to use all at once. And um, so, you know, definitely get familiar with the ones at the top of the list first, the essential tools, the quick kit. You know, like I said, the quick kit is designed to give you a whole range of different effects and it's all right there. So you don't have to go sifting through the others. Mm -hmm. The others are really just for more specific effects. So if you want more painterly brushes and um, more particular, you know, more specific textures and edges, that's what you'll find in there. But when I'm doing 
Um, you know, quick work. I will stay up here at the top. So yeah, I recommend you know getting familiar with those first. Um, getting familiar with a handful of brushes so that when you need something in particular, you can jump right to it right away. It's like having it having the tool already in your hand, so you don't have to waste any time. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess we do have just under half an hour left here. Um, so just, just so you know, uh, and then a person did have a question that was them asking what version of Photoshop these would work best in. They said that they're still using Photoshop 2020 because they had issues with the 2022 version. Okay. Um, as long as you're using Photoshop CC, Creative Cloud, I think you should work fine. Um, I actually don't have the latest update myself. Um, I'm not sure which version I'm on. Mm -hmm. But um, as long as you're using the Creative Cloud uh, version, you should have all the features necessary for these brushes. Okay. Um, let's see. I don't know. Is there any any last bit of using the like the painterly brushes in here that you'd want to make sure and mention? Hmm. Because you talked about how like you'll go through block in something with the larger brushes and a larger swath, um, then kind of refine, and then at the end, kind of add some details with some yeah, other so, smaller strokes. Um, one thing I did want to mention is, um, let's see, down in the mixer brush section, I have a folder dedicated to blend and smudge mixtures, um, and. Typically, I use my smudge tool for most blending. Um, find it very efficient, very fast for that. Like here, I have just a very soft blending. But what I found is that mixer brushes can be used as really advanced and more natural looking um, blend and smudge tools. Mm. So a couple of those. Um, you know, like the soft diffuser. It's just really, as the name implies, it's for diffusing and softening. Mm -hmm. um, I have a towel wipe. So like when I'm drawing a charcoal, uh, I might want to wipe the drawing with a towel to kind of give it a, a soft smeary effect. And that's what that does. Um, I have other fun things like uh, some marks so I can edit. Let's see. Plume smudge. Yeah. So just fun effects that are great for um, playing with edges. You want to soften edges, texture. You want to blend some areas. Um, really fun tools here. And so it's a little bit hidden inside all these folders, but just want to point them out. Um, okay. Like here, I have this one called abstraction, which is really fun. It's like it's just for creating interesting abstract shapes, which is really great if you're doing like a landscape. And you just want to kind of to fill some area with some some satisfying noise and shapes that you know you can work into much more easily than you can a blank canvas. Great tools like that. Yeah, this is great. All right. So I think this guy he's he's probably fine enough for now. Um, so yeah, a quick paint. Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, like not trying to be super accurate, but really just trying to focus on the aspects that I find interesting about the subject and um, let some areas be kind of loose as well. All right. So let's jump down to the inking. Uh, a person did ask specifically about the, the Dirty Ink set. They said they were curious how you use the draft tools found in the Dirty Ink set. Wow, you guys are just asking the best questions on the right time. <laughs> because that's exactly what I'm going to, uh, to focus on here. So the draft tools. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, before you jump into bold ink lines, you want to just sketch around a little bit first. You don't want to commit too early. Um, and so like the first couple of brushes here are inspired by 
um, you know, like the uh, the low opacity Copic markers. I don't know if you guys are familiar with those. Copic markers are pretty pricey, but you can mm -hmm. get various shades of gray um, that, you know, anything from like 10% opacity. So it's like really light, really ghosty line to like, you know, Ooh. higher opacity. So you can get a full range. And so I found like when I actually use them myself, I like the 30% opacity um, as sort of a nice way to ghost in a little sketch um, before I start laying down bold inclines. And so that's exactly what I'm going to do here. It should look really good. The tail end of the brush where it had like time to linger had a little bit more actual like saturation and wetness to it. Yeah. I, I really am happy with how these turned out. Um, all these brushes went through so much iteration. I can't even tell you how much. Like all, the, you know, I mean, there's 600 brushes in this pack, but there are, you know, far more than double that in the rejects pile. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's so many iterations on each brush. I, like I said, I got a bit obsessed with it. And I and uh, I wasn't sure if I'd ever finish for a while there. <laughs> um, one person had asked if there was any reason for using, um, what was it, the, the, the color panel that you have here uh, over using Photoshop's built-in. Yeah, so um, this is the Coolerus. 2.5 plugin, um, which is just a great color wheel. I, I think I started using this before Photoshop integrated its own color wheel. Used to, Photoshop would only have sliders. Um, um, so I, I found this really nice then. But even now, I find that it is a little bit snappier to me, a little bit easier to use than the native color wheel. So that's a plugin you can you can find and download. And when, when you're building up something in this way, um, what do you think are the main steps that you kind of process the drawing through? Yeah, so this is you know a similar mindset to the the drawing phase where I was just you know sort of loosely blocking in the big shapes that I see and trying to get them relatively um, accurate in relation to each other. Um, but, but since it's like so low opacity, it feels really, uh, you know, really simple. Really, it's not intimidating at all. Um, I'm just gonna push and pull until I feel like things are kind of in the right spot. And and sort of also just spend this time to get more familiar with my subject. <clears throat> This whole time, I'm just looking at, you know, my 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 subject, and I think it's very important to just spend time getting to know before you jump in. Do you think that there's a, a place that you often see people kind of go wrong in that foundational part of drawing, like something that you see as common mistakes? Well, like definitely getting too far ahead of yourself. Um, I want to um, say, in general, like getting too high contrast too quickly. Mm -hmm. Because if you put down some really high contrast marks um, early on, then uh, they will just kind of disrupt everything that comes after, or sort of compete with everything that comes after, and so. I find it's usually good to kind of start soft and low contrast. I recommend kind of uh, towards a middle tone value beginning and gradually introducing um, darker darks and brighter lights as you go. With this inking phase, I'm really just concerned about um, 
getting things down in the right place. Because when I start laying down the ink lines, I don't want to have to think about the, the general position of things. Mm -hmm. And I'll get into that in a moment. Do you find yourself approaching drawing um, when inking as something that's still built up, like painting and other more like um, 3D media versus something that's purely lines? Um, yeah, it's a little bit of a different mindset, though, in the sense that I, I'm working more with flat two-dimensional shapes when I'm inking. Since we're not using a full range of value, we're not using color, it really becomes more about shape design. Mm -hmm. And let's see, I think I'm about ready to start that. Get a few more notes down. You really can't go wrong, you know, just taking your time at this stage. The more you figure things out here, even though it may not look like much, the more you figure things out here, the smoother the process will go beyond this. Uh, a person asked a question about how, how do you conquer um, that urge for perfectionism? Hmm. I don't know if I've conquered it. <laughs> yeah, it uh, definitely any... that perfectionism definitely played a role in these brush sets these brush packs <laughs> well that's why it took me over two years to complete mm -hmm. um, yeah i do think it's a, it's a hard one to push back against uh especially if you have the time and space to be able to oh work on something for a long time and not just turn it in for work or to your client as for a commission. I think uh, the, the kind of the natural urge sometimes to just keep pushing things around on the page. Um, a lot of it's just kind of trying to view the work as a viewer would uh, and know what's actually making a difference versus just having right. something done. Yeah, and on that note, I. I do actually think it's a good idea to have a time limit for a lot of things. Mm. Um, a time limit forces you to focus on what really matters, what, what actually has a significant impact in an image. Whereas if you have all the time in the world, you will tend to kind of wander off and get distracted by things. Mm -hmm. image. And that's one reason uh, I, I really enjoyed drawing, you know, figure drawing from life. Because it was always about having a time limit and usually pretty short, like the max was usually like 30 minutes mm -hmm. uh, for a drawing. Um, and so, you know, just about everything I did, I felt like I didn't have time to finish it. But like I said before, it's okay if it's unfinished. Um, is you know as long as you can be interesting absolutely and uh, making, person that asked okay and making a an image interesting is like i said often not about adding a ton of detail it's about how you design the elements on the page mm -hmm. um so one person had asked if you have any favorite recommendations from the pack for drawing character concept iterations, um, like at a thumbnail scale. Yeah, so for my uh, my current work right now, I'm actually doing that. I'm doing character designs, and I have been using the concept marker up here at the top um, a ton. Um, I find um, it's just it's just very efficient, very fluid. Um, with a little bit of texture and 
natural variety and the opacity that helps to keep the drawing loose. And you usually want to keep things a little loose and sketchy when you're designing. Yeah, so think... oh, I've ghosted this in now. The layer sorted out. Um, I'll reduce the opacity a little bit more, and I'm going to grab one of my what I call my prime inks, uh, which are just the bold all-purpose inking brushes down here. And now I'm just going to start laying in some shapes. Um, so like I said, I, I, I did the work of kind of plotting things out in their correct position with the ghosting phase. Now I can not have to focus much about on that aspect. My mind is more free to just place these shapes down on the page. I'm going to try, try and keep them fairly simple, big, and graphic. Mm -hmm. So one thing I like about inking is that once you, you know, get that ghosting phase down, the rest of it can actually come together very quickly. Oh, it, it, the variables are so simple. It's just black and white. It's just big shapes and lines. Grab my keen eraser. Works well with inks. So once I get some big shapes on the canvas, um, I'm just going to begin designing them, pushing them around. Mm -hmm. and I think I need to organize my layers. There we go. So will you be going for a full overall drawing of everything here, or more just the character itself? Um, I'm just going to make some simple shapes to imply the background. Mm -hmm. So it's mostly just going to be the character. Um, is that something that you go into the drawing with first, already knowing what you're going to do with that? Uh, and does that? change how you approach the process? Um, usually, I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. And, and the, that's why I can do this with digital, but I can't do it with traditional. You know, um, This is why this is the dirty ink set, cheating. You can, you can edit anything. It's uh, fluid. And to me, it's just so freeing. I feel like I can be much more creative when I know that I can quickly change things. Mm. So right now, I'm just blocking these big shapes and trying to make them interesting. And one way to make shapes interesting is simply to make them different. I don't want shapes that are too similar in size, orientation. It's one a nice, pleasing variety going on. Uh, when you do go through with a character like this, um, how is it that you choose to kind of uh, simplify the shapes of it? Yeah, so the, the key thing, and when, again, working in black and white really helps to do this, is simply separate light and shadow. Um, so really just following the light and shadow pattern. Um, and then I will begin to add a little bit more complexity and intricacy once I have that down. But I always like to start simple. Start as simple as possible with the binary statement of light and shadow first. Mm -hmm. Because if you can do that and make the shapes interesting, you often don't need to add much more to it. Because light and shadow is, al is already such a natural way 
of making something feel lively, in my opinion. Yeah, I like the, the way that you've chosen to, to kind of emphasize the, the direction of the snout with that background line cut that you've got there. You exaggerated mm -hmm. that, like the angle of that to further play into the uh, character. And this is why I just love this style so much is because you can express so much of just how you design the shapes on the page. Mm -hmm. um, you can create so much energy you can convey so much detail that you're not actually painting. My biggest inspirations uh, uh, for inking is, uh, well, there's several, but one is uh, Jeffrey Jones, a wonderful uh, illustrator who did wonderful um, uh, he, similar to Frazetta, I think they knew each other. But another big. Uh, someone had asked um, a couple different questions, I think, that kind of play into each other. So one was, um, how long have you been an artist? And the other one was, um, what things have you worked on in the concept stage? That they might recognize. Hmm. I don't know if you'd recognize the projects I worked on. They've all been uh, relatively small, I would say. Um, and one, one of the bigger projects I'm working on now is unannounced, unfortunately, so I can't mention it. Dang. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I've been working uh, as a concept artist in games and as an illustrator for. Um, games as well, all sorts of um, projects. Um, I mean, I guess I've been working professionally for about eight years, eight, yeah, probably about eight years. Um, I started out um, not really knowing what kind of art I wanted to do, but I knew that I, I liked computers and I liked art. So I first, you know, I went and studied graphic design in college, um, which turned out, you know, I didn't really have a passion for creating logos and letterheads for companies. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to be more creative and just do illustration and art like this. But definitely the, the training that I received as, as a graphic designer has benefited me. Like, you think about designing the shapes like I'm doing right now, it's all sort of graphic design. It's looking past the subject matter and you know, looking at how these shapes relate to each other and trying to make a pleasing design. So I'm definitely thankful for that experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think even if you don't realize that you're learning something that'll apply to something else that you'll do later, chances are all of those things will play well together. Um, there was a person who was asking, well, a couple people, um, they were asking if, if you go into drawing in Photoshop with um, a mindset that is specific to drawing digitally, or uh, if this is the same as when you draw traditionally. Um. Depends on what project I'm working on and what kind of look I'm aiming for, but definitely if I'm looking for a traditional look and feel, I try to take a very similar approach as I would on paper. And that's, you know, I really designed a lot of these brushes with that in mind to uh, use the same techniques, especially the pencil brushes, uh, to be able to use the same techniques I use on paper here, with digital. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in the last five minutes of this, so All right. I do want to remind people that one of the things that brought us here today, um, besides the, the launch of this fantastic brush pack, is the fact that you can get that brush pack on sale right now with the code uh, kangaroo or on Proco. That'll get that 20% off for you. Um, 600 brushes for much less than it normally would cost is amazing. Um, Lane, you said that you, you've worked in concept design 
for uh, eight years and a full quarter of that was built or was was used building this brush pack. <laughs> yeah. So like 32 bucks for two years of Lane's life is a pretty good price. Fun way of looking at it. <laughs> he can absorb Lane's youth through every brush pack purchase. Well, well that's true. Like I, I don't honestly think many people have the, the time to spare <laughs> the build their own brushes like i did here i mean it's it's kind of ridiculous so let me do that for you <laughs> yeah and one thing that i do like about this brush pack is that it's not like it's not like some of those brush packs that you'll see out there in the wild where it's a whole set of brushes about making different kinds of like tree leaves uh, and their stamp brushes or anything these are all practical tools that you can apply to making works of all sorts i think it's a very very good brush pack yeah, so as I finish up this now, um, on top of these big basic shapes, now I begin to add a little bit more detail, such as the fur here. It's really easy to come alongside this edge. And just add some little, some hairs and cutting in and out of it to create the impression. Of the so I just want to, emphasize that it's, it all starts with the big shape design first and get those big shapes to look interesting. And, and that after you've done that, you can really do whatever you want. You can go in any direction, um, sort of work. Mm -hmm. I guess as like a last little final tip here, is there anything that you want to make sure to show people in the ink section of this brush pack real quick before we wrap up? Let's see. Um, yeah, well, I have like wash effects. I have ink smudge tools. Let me see if I can apply just a little bit of wash to this. Okay. And I, I have lots of, you know, lots of options here. You know, typically these are ordered with my most used brushes towards the top of each folder. Yeah, the right value. Yeah, so I can get a nice uh, greeny wash here with this brush. And I do think it is often nice uh, if you want to reduce the contrast in some part of your inking, um, adding a little bit of tone to it like this, like say I wanted to reduce the contrast to this lower leg down here. Um, adding a little tone like this is a good way to do that. Naturally, our eyes are drawn to contrast. So if I reduce the contrast here, it's going to increase the contrast here on the head where we might want our focal point to be. So that's kind of a, a way to approach that sort of thing. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, this, I'll let you guys play with these other things, but I have like, I have smudge tools specifically designed for working with the inks. Um, same for the dry media and the painting as well. So there's so much to explore here. I have some splatter effects um, really kind of, uh, filled with how some of these turned out. Um, yeah, so lots to play around with. I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this little exercise. Let me just zoom through what I did. Here's the inking. inking. And here's the drawing. Look at that. It looks fantastic. All right. Yeah. Um, well, as, as just one last little wrap-up thing, um, just remind people where they can find you on socials online or a website of yours, whatever you want to most share. Point yeah, so you can just, just find me on Instagram, and you'll find links for, to everything from there. I am at lane.draws on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, thank you guys all for being here. Um, just a reminder, um, you can use that code kangaroo on proco.com to get 20% off pretty much everything that isn't just in a pre-sale. Um, I don't know, I guess just have a good one. Remember to make stuff out there. Blaine, thanks for being here. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Have a good one, guys. <laughs>